This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to Killer Innovations. This uh, this week we are back here in the studio. I've been on the road traveling here most recently. Uh, we're kind of doing a ramp up going into uh, CES, so stay tuned on an upcoming show. I will be doing my normal predictions for what will be the hot topics, hot innovations, technologies that I'm expecting to see at CES. And if you're interested, you can probably go out to YouTube. There's probably a couple hundred videos of me doing predictions over my uh, the last uh, 10 years of my career. So you can judge me on how good or how bad I am at making those predictions. But this week, we've got actually a guest that's joining us here in the studio, uh, Florian Liebert is the founder and CEO for Mesosphere uh, and got introduced to, to us through a connection um, with Edelman, which many of you know about my connection with Edelman and the work with them. They brought uh, Florence company to us to, to tell us about it, and we thought it was pretty interesting and wanted to share it with you, the listeners. So, uh, Florence, thanks a lot for joining us and uh, taking the time out today. Thank you so much for having me. So give me a, so give us a little bit of background. I'm not sure how many of our listeners know about you or the company, um, but uh, interested in getting a little bit of background. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So um, I grew up in Germany in the southern part, so um, the northern tip of Bavaria, actually. And um, I moved to the U.S. when I was, well, the very first time I came to the U.S. was when I was 16 years old, and I spent a little bit of time studying abroad in uh, Colorado. And that's actually where I met one of my co-founders and uh, he was my host family there. And then I returned to Germany after uh, a short, a short while here in the U S and uh, studied computer science in Germany. Uh, after which I actually returned uh, to the U S in order to work at a couple of companies, one of them being Twitter, one of them being Airbnb. And uh, at both of those companies, I, I really learned a lot about, big data processing and how to keep large websites up and running. And uh, ultimately, we, we leveraged some of that knowledge and uh, created Mesosphere out of some of the software we created there. So part of it was open source software that we created there. And then, of course, the team and the relationships that I've built in both of these companies over the years. That's interesting. I didn't realize you had a Colorado connection, given that that's where we're actually sitting here. Um, the, uh, the Killer Innovation Show broadcasts here from uh, from Colorado. Uh, so you were both at Twitter and at Airbnb. So give us a little bit of a comparison between that those experiences, because uh, having a little bit of my own familiarity, they're they're two distinctly different companies. Yeah, so I actually joined Twitter at the tail end of 2009. And back then, uh, Twitter was still uh, in its infancy, I'd say. Um, but Twitter had two things going for it that actually no other no other social network had at the time. One was everything was real time. So you send a tweet and it, was, it appeared right away in someone else's uh, timeline. The other one was that you could have an unlimited amount of followers. We actually ended up calling this the Justin Bieber problem because Justin Bieber was at the time one of the most uh, followed Twitter users out there. And every time Justin Bieber would tweet something, more than 10 million real-time inbox deliveries, if you will, had to be made. And that put an immense strain on Twitter's hardware and software, of course, and um, uh, oftentimes led to outages. And those outages, in turn, actually harmed Twitter's user growth, and that was one of the one of the uh, one of the things we really had to solve. And um, that's that's where some of the technology that we now are productionalizing, well, or that we are now developing for everybody, that's where some of that technology really originated. Yeah, I remember back in the early Twitter days where you'd get the uh, the fail whale, um, yeah. you know, page up on Twitter, and then everybody was hopping on and. You know, or uh, blasting out on other social medias their complaints about you know the fail whale uh, um, appearing uh, over and over again. But again, I think you know Twitter was the first ones out there really that had that kind of an experience of massive amount of data, and it could be pretty spiky, as you say, right? You know, yeah. Bieber puts out a post, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the just the sheer uh, acceleration of data movement was massive. 
Yeah, we we had a similar phenomenon during the World Cup, the soccer World Cup. Every every time one of the one of the top teams uh, were shooting a goal, um, you'd see a massive increase in in the tweets per second. Was actually the metric uh, with which we measured how much activity was going on on the site. And I remember there were countless hours where um, the entire engineering team was on call freaking out about uh, the site going down because if during a moment like the soccer world cup where the entire world is really watching what twitter is doing um on what's going on on twitter if there's an outage that was it was just really bad for our business yeah but then you you go to airbnb completely different business model though completely different not not in the same category as far as uh, yeah you you so so if, yeah so from the from the outside it's really it's really a totally different business model it's a it's a obviously a marketplace for for space and um a uh, super interesting company but if you if you really go and look at the challenges that both of these companies were facing they weren't too dissimilar and uh, Twitter was growing at, at exponential scale, and so was Airbnb, actually, in terms of users. Now, with Airbnb, the challenge was um, was actually a lot in search. So, well, Twitter also had a lot of uh, search-related problems that we had to solve, but uh, really, the, the as I mentioned, the real-time nature of Twitter was the, the largest challenge. At Airbnb, a big challenge was that you didn't want to really show static search rankings. Imagine... Uh, imagine you and I are both looking for a room in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we both get served the exact same view of a search of a search results page. Um, now I book it. You try to book it. Well, uh, it's no longer available for you. Now imagine there's a, a number of a number of users, like a thousand or so, all looking at the same static search ranking. Um, then for uh, some users, it's going to be a very very uh, uh, frustrating experience to not be able to book. Uh, a place at all on the first page and uh, those users would likely never use the service again and uh, so we had to do a lot around personalized search um, there were a lot of machine learning and big data problems that we had to solve at the time and um, yeah so also another thing that we had to solve at airbnb similar to twitter is we had to really create a platform for future innovation so that the developers data scientists and product managers could easily Turn around new innovations and uh, and present them on the uh, on, on the on the site. That was not that was not too dissimilar from Twitter, where we had to launch new features constantly. Right, right. <laughs> but you know, I think you know, with what everybody saw happening, you know, with these large data problems, you know, a lot of the big guys, whether it be Google or Facebook or whatever, have all put a lot of investment into creating their own platforms. Right, so. It's not like there's a there's an industry standard approach to solving this challenge, right? The innovation is the experience the user gets. What a lot of people don't think about is is all of the plumbing that has to happen to enable those kinds of innovation. So, you know, what are some of the bigger guys doing to solve the problem? I know you've got a product that you're out there, but I'm, I'm interested in kind of a little bit of a comparison with, you know, because Google's out there now, they've got and they've open sourced some of their stuff, that type of yeah. thing. So. so, so actually, uh, open source is I think the keyword to really focus on. I think um, a lot of companies now are actually collaborating um, on sites like GitHub in order to um, solve these infrastructure problems together. And Google, as you mentioned, has has actually uh, released systems like. Kubernetes uh, has released systems like TensorFlow, which we can talk about in more detail. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, those are actually technologies that we were now able to embrace. And we make them now extremely easy to use with our platform. And that's actually one of the biggest, that was one of the biggest motivators for us to create Mesosphere, to make it insanely easy to build and scale world-changing technology, just like the big players out there. Yeah, well, that's always the challenge, right? You know, you got an entrepreneur who's got a great vision, but the heavy lift of trying to create these these platforms that are highly scalable to take on the challenges of rapid growth, large subscriber base, uh, passionate, active subscriber base, all you know, all the challenges that become the nightmare scenario if they all collide at the wrong time. Yeah. So I, I think there's some really interesting anecdotes we can talk about um, when it comes to actually uh, 
innovating on a cruise ship later as well. So there's a really cool story I can talk about when it comes to actually creating a cloud on a cruise ship. And that's actually a use case that our software is being used for. Okay. Let's, we're going to take a quick commercial break when we come back. Okay. So, you know, so Florian leaves the, leaves the teaser for the next segment. So if you want to talk about innovating on a cruise ship, uh, scaling uh, systems and infrastructure, uh, you're not going to want to go anywhere. So when we come back, we're going to pick up the conversation uh, talking about Mesosphere with uh, Florian Liebert, who's the founding uh, CEO of the company, and uh, we'll learn more about the real challenges of large-scale infrastructure to support game-changing breakthrough innovation. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're listening to Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are here today in the studio, but before we hop right back into this segment, need to do a quick shout-out to one of our sponsors, Zoom. Zoom is a technology that we've been using for the last two years here in the studio, that allows us to bring guests in, like our guest today, to become part of the conversation. Zoom is a tool that small businesses, mediums, large enterprises have embraced. It's become one of the top video collaboration tool technologies out there today. It's ranked as one of the top tools on all of the mobile apps. It, you, it works out great in uh, your, your conference rooms. I use it every day to talk with my team around the world. And in fact, here uh, where I'm the CEO... We've actually have replaced all of our other video collaboration technologies and focused just on using Zoom. So check it out. Zoom is made available a free account. You can check it out over at killerinnovations.com slash Zoom. And that free account will allow you to collaborate with up to 50. That's right, five zero fifty 50 people to check it out to see if this tool will work for you. Check it out. You will not be disappointed. So, Florian, let's pick up our conversation. We've been talking about Twitter. We've been talking about Airbnb. But there's a lot of other industries and technologies that are going digital. You know, technologies or companies that you just in the past would never think of them as being highly digital are now shifting their models. Automotive being one of the ones that now when you look at just the sheer amount of data that uh, these auto manufacturers are talking about with regards to, you know, future vehicles that they're working on, so are you guys involved in looking at those non kind of traditional digital industries? Absolutely. So we created our technology to really help every company out there in their journey through digital transformation. And automotive is actually really interesting because if you think about a self-driving car, and you already mentioned this, the amount of data that's being produced is uh, is really, really large. And uh, the main sensors there, of course, are you have HD cameras on each vehicle. You have LIDAR, so a three-dimensional map of space that's being that's being sensed with lasers. You have radar, sonar, and of course, GPS. Uh, and between all of those, those five data sources, you have about four terabytes of data for each car that's being emitted for eight hours of driving. And if you multiply this um, and, and you look at like, hey, it, what happens if these cars roll out into production? Like when, when into, 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 into serious production, when you have hundreds of thousands or millions of these cars roaming a single country like, uh, or, or a single state, right? Um, you will need a much different kind of data infrastructure and you will need uh, different ways of handling this data. And um, the, great, the great news is that companies like Google, uh, they have released technology like TensorFlow, which help with one part of this uh, data processing problem problem, namely machine learning. But that's not that's not all you need. You need to transport the data. You need to store some of the data streams, or you, or you need to analyze some of the data streams. You need to store some of the computational data that happens. Uh, then you need to serve it back up. So it's a really complex setup um, of, of capabilities that you need. And traditionally, when I mean, I say traditionally very loosely here because I think this only goes back five years to when, when cloud really became a thing. But um, so far, 
uh, in, in consumer internet, uh, cloud-like infrastructure has basically given you these, cap these base capabilities. And what we wanted to do with Mesosphere is we wanted to say, look, these are these are problems that you don't just find in one industry. You don't just find them in consumer internet. You find them everywhere. And um, I mean, in today's world, uh, not not just with cars, but even even in, in the smart home, you have 13 sensors per house. So all this data needs to be all this data needs to be processed, stored, transported, served back up. And that's what what we're aiming to really help with with our software. You can install all of these components with a single click and get your um, public cloud-like experience without the lock-in. So, yeah. So, I mean, when you start talking about, you know, industries like um, automotive, they've got a lot of technical resources, technical capabilities, big yeah. IT teams. But what we're what I'm interested in is, is how do you push this technology down so that it truly becomes a more level playing field? Because for some of these technologies, the complexity to run them is huge. And it, it actually becomes the barrier for early stage companies to be able to even get onto the playing field because they, they don't have those kinds of technical resources available to them. Yeah, so, so I think that's a, that's a great point that you make there. I mean, uh, if you think about a traditional engineer who works on, on uh, uh, who's an electric engineer working on a car, right? They, are, uh, they were for the longest time focused on programming ASICs, right? They like, like pro processes. They were not really thinking about large and complex distributed systems and of course in today's programming environment where, where we as i just outlined you have all of these components uh, distributed systems are the new normal and so um it's of course really hard to find that talent and so i think this is one of the really big driving factors that has made um that has made cloud computing so uh, successful because you you basically don't have to worry about operationalizing every single one of these complex technologies. You can just use them with uh, swiping a credit card. And um, the the problem, of course, with cloud is that um, in these industries like automotive and so forth, they, it's it's not it's not as easy. There are there are sometimes regulatory uh, requ requirements that aren't met with a public cloud. There are sometimes uh, logistical problems that you can't overcome. Like, for example. And uh, not all the cloud service providers have a have a really um, have a really a dense grid of data centers. And if you're talking about four terabytes per car for eight hours of driving, the amount of data that has to go through these pipes is just uh, immense. And that's why we're seeing a lot of companies that really want to bring the ease of cloud technologies into their private data centers and. Uh, that's what we saw actually with Twitter, right? Twitter had such a massive operation, and it would have been uh, it would have been prohibitive, prohibitively expensive to to go fully cloud. But they still wanted the same capabilities, which is why we wrote some of the software in the first place. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's really exciting to, that we're really such a big part in transforming so many different industries. Well, and I think, you know, part of it is, is one, just access to the technology, right? So the cloud allowing you to burst and grow without having to overbuild data centers. When I was one of the founders at Telligent, you know, we basically had to build out a nationwide set of data centers. This is back in the late 90s because there's no such thing as cloud infrastructure. So you had to anticipate because if you misestimated the, the demand and you found yourself short, you know, you were 30 to 45 days waiting for new servers to show up on your loading dock. So that's one side of the problem. The other side of the problem then becomes the skill sets to then run. So even though you have cloud for bursting, you still need to have that skill set. So I think your point is right on. And how do you take these tools and wrap them and simplify them so that anybody can realistically take advantage of them? So we're going to take another quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to continue on our conversation on, on Mesosphere and, and learn more about the solution that, well, Florian and his team have developed and allows and, and really levels the playing field for innovation for all industries. So stay right there. We'll be right back. You're listening to Killer Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network.
This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. Before we hop back into the show, I need to do a quick shout-out to one of our other sponsors, which is HP. Now, many of you are going to say, hold on, Phil, you were the CTO for HP for almost 10 years. Um, Isn't this a little uh, biased? And I'll tell you, yes. Uh, I'm still a big fan. I think their products and technologies are absolutely fantastic. And HP has joined up and partnered with us to sponsor the show. And actually, their sponsorships allows us to put more money into the two charities that we support. One is HackingAutism.org, which actually was started at HP and uh, supports and enables people on the autism spectrum for finding jobs, employment, technologies, um, skills, and, and the such. And the second is is Pioneer Education, which is an experimental educational model looking at how do you train innovation and creativity. You can check out both of those at pioneer.education or over at hackingautism.org. And we do a shout out for HP, thanking them for their support of the show, which allows us to put more support behind those two charities. So, Florian, let's pick up our conversation. We were talking about cloud and really the role of the cloud. And, you know, look, everybody's out there. Everybody's going to the cloud. But does the the model of the cloud as we think about it apply to every business or every industry? Or is there a variety of different cloud models? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's an excellent question. I think if you I – th- I think first you need to really look at uh, what is it that the cloud <clears throat> gives – its users, and I think one of the one of the real um, one of the real uh, positive impacts of cloud was that you, as a developer, could go in and swipe your credit card and get some hardware infrastructure. And from there on out, what the cloud service providers ended up doing is, uh, and uh, AWS being the the pioneer here, uh, they ended up building on top of that and providing more and more services which served as the building blocks for modern applications and um, I'll, I'll go back to one of the one of the um, uh, one of the statements I made earlier so a lot of these building blocks are around transporting data are around transforming data are around storing data and then serving that bit data back up to uh, to the end users um, and uh, AWS has done a, an incredible job over the last couple of years building each and every one of these uh, well, well silos out and and actually creating a lot of choice in these silos, right? So you have hundreds of these different cloud services. But in there actually lies the problem. Imagine if you're an organization with hundreds or thousands of developers and you're actually building towards proprietary APIs from a cloud service provider, you're locked into that cloud. And uh, the argument that cloud, well, lock-in doesn't matter and cloud is really cheap, doesn't really hold because cloud is cheap actually where, when it comes to the lower layers, the infrastructure as a service layer. And that's because CPU, RAM, and disk, are they are commoditized. They are pretty much the same on every cloud. But these higher level services for transporting, storing, serving, um, and uh, and uh, yeah, processing data, those services, they're pretty expensive and you pay per use. And those services, there is no real portability between the clouds. And that's actually what our technology uh, is, is changing. But uh, there's, another, there's another aspect to cloud. So uh, I think we, we always assume that you can have a centralized data center, and that's where cloud, of course, can work pretty well. But one of the use cases that I, um, I mentioned earlier was um, cruise lines. So we're working with a company called Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, a great company, and they've recently launched a digital transformation campaign. And they have actually created an application. Uh, when you when you enter the cruise ship, they can actually uh, they can actually enrich the customer experiment the, the customer experience quite a bit. And a cruise ship uh, is when it's not tied to a port has a pretty hard time getting a good internet connection because uh, you have to go over satellite uh, the satellite uh, still has some of the uh, some of the uh, problems that lie within the speed of uh, light is not that uh, is fast but not that fast so you still you still get high latency which creates a bad customer experience so what that co- what that company has actually done is they've created on their cruise ships mini clouds or edge clouds and these edge clouds they provide the building blocks for these applications that then their customers can use which create a much better experience for their customers and i find that really fascinating because 
if you would have told me uh, five years ago um, that the technology that we're working on would be enabling an amazing customer experience on a cruise ship today or would be enabling the next generation of autonomous technologies uh, I, I probably I probably would have thought like ah oh, that sounds really interesting but uh, I, I was also under the impression everything is moving to a centralized cloud and I think uh, I think the world is going to be hybrid and I think uh, we're seeing a lot of data points for that and uh, that's that's what's I think really exciting so give us a little bit of uh, a little bit more information about mesosphere so give if you know, give us the your uh, your elevator pitch here on how why would someone be interested in your technology specifically, your innovation? Sure. So um, we basically provide these building blocks for modern applications. So um, uh, message queues are there for transporting data from one point to another. You have stream processing that actually does transformations on those uh, on the data that's being transported. You, we have. Um, uh, open source. We, we have operationalized open source technologies that allow you to uh, store that data um, and to serve that ba data back up. To make machine learning technologies such as TensorFlow ridiculously easy to use. We are basically democratizing the use of all of these open source and some proprietary tools and allowing any company to take advantage of this um, of this innovation um, by just clicking a button. And so so what you can imagine our technology being is essentially like a cloud delivered as a software that you can run on your own data center or on a cloud, um, but not being not locking you into that cloud's uh, upper layers. So we run on any infrastructure and uh, we deliver uh, the, mo the most uh, the most relevant open source technology and operationalize it for you. So in summary, then, what you really are doing is you're allowing a new, you know, new company to put their dollars that has direct impact on their customers, not needing to overinvest on the plumbing and infrastructure. You've radically simplified the, the, uh, the framework or the foundation that they're going to build their next generation experiences on top of. Absolutely, yeah. So we really lower uh, lower the barrier of entry for companies to be leveraging these amazing technologies that get released. And we actually, I mean, you look at GitHub today and you see an explosion of tools. It can take it can take months for an engineer at a company to even try out the different machine learning um, software components that are out there, and then trying to make a decision as to which one uh, they want to go with. And we make that. Uh, much much easier. We save a lot of time. We we um, get you your products to market much faster because of it. And then of course we operationalize all of these software components so that you can run without any downtime. So how big is Mesosphere now? How, you know employee base. You know I don't. I how big are you guys? So we are about three hundred people now. And um, we have we were spread across. Uh, obviously, we have our HQ here in San Francisco, which is great. Great, uh, love living here. Um, but we also have uh, an, a development office in Hamburg, Germany, which is uh, architecturally it was just voted one of the best cities to live in. Actually, uh, it's a beautiful place. And then we have some sales uh, offices uh, across the world. So one in Beijing, one in um, London, and one in New York City. And then, as you and I were talking before we started the, the broadcast, uh, you pointed out that uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, the enterprise side of the company after they split after HP split in two, is actually an investor in you guys. I didn't realize that. Yeah, so HPE um, under Mac Whitman led our Series C financing, and um, uh, they've been a tremendous partner to us. Uh, they make obviously amazing hardware, and, and we have a. I mean, our our software runs on any hardware, but they've been a great partner in, in really helping us uh, get to where we are today. Yeah, well, I won't I won't toss more onto the HP because otherwise the people <laughs> will think that I'm not, I'm, I'm still an HP fanboy, which I will readily admit that I am. Um, so, when, hey, Florian, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to stay for the next segment because I want to ask you to step back during the commercial break. Think about what advice would you give to uh, entrepreneurs today, thinking about whether it's innovating on top of something like a mesosphere when you think about scaling or advice you would give yourself, if, what you know now back when you were starting uh, mesosphere. 
Um, but when we come back, I would like for you to, to share that advice to the listeners so they've got something that they can really sink their teeth into and take away. So we're going to take a step away here for a quick commercial break. And when we come back, uh, Jorge's going to share with us his, 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 uh, his advice to us, the listeners, on uh, what we can do to uh, drive our own innovations. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're listening to Killer Innovations on the Biz Talk Radio Network. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovator's Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome back to Killer Innovations. Hey, Florian, when we took the break the last, uh, in the last segment, I asked you to kind of think about it during the commercial break, your advice to the listeners. Now, I gave you kind of an open um, option. You could talk about how to use uh, your technology for innovators or the experiences you had starting from being an engineer to starting your own company and now it's something that's of, 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 of sufficient size. So what advice would you give the listeners? So, yeah, um, I think that's also a great question. Uh, and I think, I think it's, the, the, there are really two answers here. There's one for, for, me as an engineer and i think one if i look back at what was one of the biggest uh, or most impactful things in my engineering career it was really open source technology and i think open source has really changed the way that uh, engineers actually um uh, that engineers actually contribute not only to a company but to the entire ecosystem and of course it also helps you as an engineer to uh, be a big part of an open source project because as you uh, switch maybe to a new job into another company, that's really your new CV, right? The contributions that are visible in the open source ecosystem are your new CV. So I think definitely I, I tell myself back then, uh, I would have probably even earlier than I did started with uh, contributing to open source. When it comes to being an entrepreneur, I think one of the, one of the things you do, especially um, uh, if you come from engineering, is you uh, you tend to analyze and try to really uh, take all the variables into consideration when you make a decision. And I think actually when you're building a business, um, you have to really fail fast. And it's much it's much more important to make a quick decision with uh, even even if you even if you could be wrong, than to fall into what I call analysis paralysis, right? Where you basically, uh, where you're basically trying to evaluate, 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 and you don't move yourself, your company and, and your team forward. And uh, I can give you a concrete example for actually, um, for this. So, um, early on we were, we were really focused around, uh, what, what I call now container, what we call now container orchestration. And, um, um, and, Container orchestration was great because it's about serving data back up to customers. And um, but we, we were building differentiated technology. And then actually um, Google came out with a really awesome project that we have since uh, adopted and, uh, and it's called Kubernetes. We couldn't have seen this coming. We could have like back then, we could have back then said like, oh, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to build X, Y, and Z into our proprietary systems. And uh, in the end, we said, "Look, let's just let's just use what Google has built. They have built some incredible software, and let's focus on on other areas where we can really innovate and where our technology is really unique. And uh, in fact, our technology was really good when it comes to data processing, and it it was always good there, and it was always good that we kept kind of a um, a, a, str- a strong." that we were strongly focused on that as well. And so once the decision came out, once once Google came out with this, uh, with this open sourcing of Kubernetes, we were able to really quickly turn around and say, look, let's, let's actually put uh, some of our engineering efforts on hold. Let's embrace this technology. Uh, it's great technology and let's make it ridiculously easy to use. And we were able to, from there on learn, and do the same thing, for example, for TensorFlow. And uh, now we actually offer this a suite of products that are uh, open source and extremely easy to use. And uh, so I think fail fast is, is the, the advice I'd give to anybody starting a business because you just don't know 
what's around the corner. You can't always see around the corner and see what some of the other players in the market are going to do. Yeah, and I think it's else it's what's one that we we all tend to embrace. But I think it's kind of a sub lesson in there though is is don't fall in love with your own development work. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, hard, I think that's it, also really it, important. It's hard to get engineers once they start building something to get them to a stop and adopt somebody else's work, you know, into into an organization. Right. We tend to want to we almost kill innovations by loving it so much that uh, uh, we miss out on opportunities to actually take our skill sets and apply them in areas where you can actually add differentiated value rather than uh, over-investing in one area or not. So, hey, if people want to keep up with what you're doing, what's the best coordinates for them to follow you and also to find out more about Mesosphere? Yeah, so um, my Twitter handle is at FLO, so flow, which is f short for Florian. And um, uh, so follow me on Twitter. Go to www.mesosphere.com. And we have a really great blog where we publish some really interesting technical content, uh, great case studies. And of course, you can also find out more about our technology and how we're really uh, helping make amazing technology really easy to use. And we'll have all of those uh, coordinates over in the show notes over at killerinnovations.com. So you can check that out. We'll have all the links so that you can go check out uh, Mesosphere, but also keep up with what uh, Florian's doing. And the fact that you've got a three-letter Twitter handle definitely uh, is a uh, – that's like the vanity license plate for uh, for Twitter followers. So I'm sure there's a, a great story behind uh, that that back in the early days of Twitter. So, Florian, thanks again for taking the time to uh, to join us today here at Kill Innovations. Wish you the best of luck. Love to stay in touch and uh, stay up on uh, what, uh, what you're doing. And uh, congratulations on uh, the success you've had. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and sure. hope to talk to you soon, Phil. Great. So as we wrap up today's show, we are, uh, you know, like I said, I've been on the road here lately. Um, I'm getting ready for the Consumer Electronics Show. So if any of you are going to be at CES and you want to connect, just drop me a note over at phil at killerinnovations.com, and we'll coordinate it. I will be there all week. Um, the first part of the week, I'll be hosting some private tour activities um, on the show floor in the second half of the week, I will be uh, recording uh, interviews for upcoming uh, shows. So if you've got an interesting story or you know of an interesting story that's being told at CES and you think it might be appropriate for the show, I really appreciate you letting me know. With that, we're going to wrap it up for uh, this week. Remember, don't let the innovation antibodies get you down. There will always be critics of any program idea that you're working on. And trust the fact that if someone tells you that your idea is crazy, and the, the more crazy they make it sound, it's probably a much better idea. So don't let the innovation antibodies get you down. Go out there, take those ideas that you're working on, and uh, make them real. And go out there and change the world. And with that, love to hear from you. Drop us a note. And with that, have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>